<clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everybody. My name's James. I'm a bookseller here at Grolier, and I want to welcome you all to the event tonight. And um, thank you so much for coming. We are so looking forward to this. Hello to everyone on Zoom. Um, I am here to introduce Joan Navier Kane, um, who will be providing the introductory remarks. So without further ado, here's Joan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, 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 thank you for coming this evening or for joining us on Zoom. Um, I'm awkwardly carrying holding Santi's book in my hand. I'm just going to put it right here. Um, um, I'm really honored to um, share this evening with you and grateful to Grolier um, for the venue. Um, who knew about Omicron when I set this date? Um, but um, in any case, I'm really um, honored to share this evening and also in the space. Um, I remember coming here for the first time as a 17 year old and um, how important it is to me and how vital this space is for so many writers and readers. Um, and it's an honor tonight to um, read with Sasha and Santi. Um, and um, I think, um, well, I think of the long tradition of Grolier and then I think of the long tradition of uh, poetry in indigenous culture and, um, and all the work and scholarship and community that um, we had made together. And um, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, but I will introduce Sasha LaPointe, um, whose first book is coming out in March. Um, it is a memoir called Red Paint. It's out with Counterpoint. Um, it already has a Publishers Weekly review, um, which, yeah, um, it's a big deal. Um, and her second book um, will be a book of poetry out um, from Milkweed in 2023 um, called Rose Quartz, from which we'll be reading tonight. Sasha was the Jack Kent Cook um, Scholarship recipient at the um, Graduate Program in Creative Writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, she has held, uh, she's been a Hugo Fellow at Hugo House. She had the King Street uh, residence uh, from Seattle Arts and Cultures Department and um, is also in an amazing band. Um, and um, I'm, I think um, the first time I met Sasha was at a reading in Santa Fe in 2013. And she was an undergraduate, um, also got her BFA in creative writing from the Institute of American Indian Arts. And um, I, was talking with her last night about that amazing lineup of poets. Um, of course, Santa Fe is not unlike Cambridge and that there's a good, there's good poets. There's a plenty, there's a lot of good poets in Santa Fe. Um, but I was really struck um, by Sasha's um, confidence in herself and in her work um, and her strength um, and also the creative risks that she is willing to take um, she got a double MFA from IAIA in both poetry and creative nonfiction. And um, I'm really honored to introduce her to you tonight and um, hope that you will follow her books in the years to come. Um, so thank you, Sasha. Joan. Hello, I am Sasha LaPointe. My Skagit name is Takshablu. Um, I am so honored to be here um, sharing space with you all and um, so honored to be part of Joan's book launch. So thank you. I'm gonna get into some poems here. Uh, if you could, if I could travel back in time and tell my mom that 15 year old me <laughs> who was like loitering in a parking lot and hanging out with like skateboarders would someday be reading in Harvard Square, uh, she would probably explode. So this is, this is wild and exciting and I'm super happy to be here. Um, I'm going to start with some poems from this beat up little scene um, that I made at the, the residency at King Street Station that Joan mentioned. And it's kind of special because I never, if you would have, again, time travel, the theme of the evening, um, told me that this would become a collection of poems. Um, I, I would not have believed you. So um, I'm stoked that this will be 
be a thing in the world and not just like a Xerox mess stapled and taped together. <clears throat> red paint all it ever was a blanket sagging off my shoulders in the smoke thick night her hands as they scooped it up against the pounding of drums how they thundered my limbs in storm song the four stars i counted outside the only window like ghosts the smoke as it escaped leaving behind its orange glow and the dancers cedar woven my eyes falling heavy past three in the morning and this is when she tells me the red paint is for healing the canoe my grandmother gave me when my grandmother hit record, the record button on the cassette player, it startled my great aunt. What is it? What does it do? It's going to capture the language, my grandmother said, to keep it. My great aunt thought about this for a long while. When she was a child, she traveled by river, by inland waters, to relatives, to bring them fish, to carry the news. She looked down at the cassette recorder and nodded. Ah, she said. This is just another kind of canoe. The last time we would eat together, we sat by a picture window overlooking the channel. She pushed fried oysters around her plate, Chardonnay pooling on white linen. At six, I licked frosting bone white from China. My mother, embarrassed, reached for the plate. My grandmother slapped her hand away. Just let her enjoy it and we rotated high above the city, the space needle spinning clouds into sugar. Now she looks over oysters out past the docks. Remember when all of this was underwater, she points a greasy fork to the hill beyond the bridge. They kept the dead up there before they came and built a church. I see canoes high above a white chapel in branches of trees no longer there. Speeding along asphalt, along LaConnor Whitney Road, the back seat sticky with whiskey, the smell of cow shit of cut grass. I look out at the snaking body of water contained, curling and flexing to keep up. It was all underwater, she'd say, until they came and built dikes and farmhouses, planted fields just for tulips, stretching lakes of daffodils. <sighs> With my head against glass, bottle of whiskey in my lap, I squint until the channel breaks free, until the roads are water again. When I woke to find him there, breathing heavy blonde, 210 pounds of quarterback of animated Coors Light above me, I learned to sever head from heart, dunked my head beneath water that was no longer there, to breathe in river silt and mud, count silver scales of fish and all the white pebbles rushing past. We learn to say, I just let it happen. We learn to use words in forgotten languages. I learned to hold my breath beneath the currents, unaware of the boat on the riverbank waiting there. What he should have had. It's not fair, says my brother over his pint glass. I belong on a yacht. We had that, you know, we had a yacht. We never had a yacht. You mean one of mom's boyfriends did? I poke at the red filmed ice of my spent Bloody Mary. I order another as my brother continues his story of what we should have had. All that shit, he says, those rich guys, those condos in the city, but she moved us. To Swinomish. At this, there is a long sigh, an eye roll, another beer in his fist, and he drinks it angrily. And I am noticing how handsome my brother is. His pitch colored hair, his jaw, big smile, how he looks like Superman, 
like Freddie Prince Jr. in some romantic comedy made for teenagers in the 90s. Driving back up the coast to our ancestral home, I sleep in the woods, sent in pictures of whales and a roadside motel we stayed in as kids. But he is busy with his list of all the things we should have had. He is writing them down and marking them off. When we say goodbye, I watch my older brother try not to cry. I tell him to be less angry, but it's too late. My brother has already pulled out his boning knife. Look what happened to you. He repeats it. He carves a fish shaped hole right into me. Look what happened to you. It's so nice to have a real book someday. It's a mess. Um, I'm going to read Newlywed, and it's, it's about getting divorced. Newlywed. I wanted to make you a blueberry pie this afternoon, all sugar and rolling pins, all fingerprints and flour. I've heard that's what wives do. Instead, I stared at the ceiling, began to worry, what would you do with me come five o'clock? and you open the door, throw down your keys and find me in a forest of cardboard and wrapping, a mess of discarded wedding gifts because I don't actually know what to do with a lay crusette. And maybe I haven't even made it to the kitchen or the pie crust. Maybe I've smashed all the berries between my fingers one by one. And you'll find me in the wilderness of our living room, crawling on my hands and knees juicy blue war paint across my cheeks, and you'll clean me up like you do. Draw a bath, check for sharp objects, broken glass, and you'll leave the door cracked as you play guitar in the next room. But what if it isn't enough this time when I climb from the deep well of that tub, crawl into bed still warm and slippery, and you touch me and I know you want me to be better. Will you drive me to the edge of the city at sundown? Will you touch my neck the whole way? Will you tell me it's better this way as you leave me at the line of trees, shadow branches reaching out to me like hands? The Rose Garden at Balboa Park. I watched the sun come down a flight of stairs towards me, rubbing his hands together, shaking his hair to one side. In the shadow of a tower, I am watching the light move across painted tile, guilty admiring the Spanish architecture. An old mission building, sprawling, pointed rooftops ornate and arched across land where a tribe used to be are the things that conquer us always so striking. And by now the sun has reached me, golden strands of light fall across my cheeks as he kisses me into blush and blister, splits my lip open with his finger and spits into my mouth because he knows I am thirsty, because he wants to leave part of himself inside of me and I am begging him to colonize me, an inside joke but I always feel bad after laughing. The sun is playing with my hair and talking about playing a show later. I am looking at the roses, a moon-shaped garden at dusk, and I pluck one that most resembles him, ember colored and bright, so I might keep the light a moment longer. I just have two more. <clears throat> Redwoods. I told myself I've, I'd never write a poem about the Redwoods because it's been done, because I've made this trip now twice with people I've loved. And what's left to say about old wood? I told you I'd be okay as I left you curbside in San Francisco, drove away to a sad 90s playlist, not crying along to the music, but in my best riot girl kind of way. At least I had to make a fire 
after a five hour drive, had to watch my sad vegan hot dogs as they blistered into something unnatural in the flames. I am tired of writing about old things like grandmothers and languages that are dying and these trees big and mythic, too old to give a shit about what is happening in the cities bodies gunned down in the street, po pandemics, police brutality, and this old growth just towering, like we told you so, like you didn't see this was coming. Further north and further from you, I swim in rivers and lakes. Outside of Arcata, I already miss California, hot sand and sex and your face when it is still sleeping. Through Newport, through Brookings, I am drubbing my fingers on the steering wheel, singing along with Janet and Bikini Kill. If I was your girl, all the things I'd do to you. Pull off in a town that smells of cow shit and seagrass. Ignore the Trump signs. Forget that I'm not allowed to pump my own gas. Make you call out my name and ask who it belongs to. You asked me to move in with you, and that's big, like Haystack Rock, like drive-in movie theaters. They're parking lots all painted and abandoned. And I'm considering this because I miss San Diego. Your blonde hair or pigment bomb pops melting over my fingers, blue and sticky like when I was a kid. How is it I have never dated someone who is also Coast Salish or at least indigenous? Instead, it's Disney's Pocahontas, her animated dad with his hands up. These white men are dangerous and I come running. Maybe it's time I slept with someone who understands me traditionally, who shares my spirit dreams but you have your van and that California tan and you have kickflips and ollies. And I'm a sucker for you when you come home from surfing, limping because of a stingray. Today, I am in Astoria and the trees are different here. The sea is cold and gray like it is supposed to be. And they say where you're from never leaves your body. This land is in my blood and it likes to remind me. You think I forgot? Motherfucker, you redwoods are a rude awakening. I passed the places that marked me Indian, the signs that point me to the reservation, Dead Man's Cove and the Pioneer Museum, trailer homes like bones and seals you can feed like dogs. You want me to move in with you, and I'm looking at the succulents on the dash plucked from your yard and jammed into a makeshift planter that once housed LaCroix cans wilted and thirsty for sun, a sweet memento, but I hate how we've displaced them. I am in love with a white boy from California, an artist, a skateboarder, a beautiful colonizer who brings me coffee every morning, who grew up sun swimming, who knows how to hold me when I black out during intimacy because I have forgotten for a moment that I am safe. And if I am to relocate, I will remember to stop at these trees will hit the steering wheel hard and singing because I will never be done writing about all the things. Thank you, this is my last one. It's really hard to read my mask. I just want to put that out there, so sorry. But it's important. <clears throat> Teach me to say I love you in your language. I have forgotten how to speak, like something caught in my throat, a fishbone broken, splintering me into something quiet, muted and starlike. The word for sky is shakolglut. Teach me to say, just stay, stay put, stay here. Because I have forgotten how to be inside my own body, whatever my body has become beneath your tongue conquered and ugly, malformed and mispronounced. Teach me a word better than survivor, like watching my grandmother pour black coffee in the kitchen and the stacks of legal pads filled up with her words, and I tried to listen. The word for language is quidguatid. Teach me to say I love you, because every time I walk into a restaurant to meet a date, I hesitate. I remember the trees along Portland Avenue in their red bows, like gift packages on Christmas morning. This is to honor assault survivors. How my mother tied each one, hugging their bark in ribbon. 
And I think of this as he pulls the chair out, takes my jacket and pours the wine red into the glass and asks if I am hungry. Red is what I remember when I think of how he will take me home and have to learn how to unwrap me. Teach me to say I love you because what good is a ribbon if it cannot hold us together where we have been broken. Teach me to speak in a language older than words, specifically the words of white men whose tongues touch everything. Quiet yourself and listen. Oh, oh, shibiti chud. Oh, oh, shibiti chud. Like a sigh I would make as a child, comfortable and safe. Then the thud of my heart as it beats in my chest, its drum as it drums inside my ribcage. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I was, it's an honor um, to also read with Santee Frazier, who currently serves as a visiting professor um it, in the MFA, MFA program um at UMass Amherst um he has also he was also most recently um the director of the MFA program in creative writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts um through the pandemic and um and before that um was one of the founding faculty members of the MFA program in creative writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um Santi Frazier has an MFA from Syracuse University, um, where he's also taught. Um, he also has a BFA in creative writing from the Institute of American Indian Arts. He's been the recipient of fellowships and residencies from the School for Advanced Research. Uh, he's been a National Native Artist Fellow. He's also received the Lannan Residency Fellowship. And there's probably a few more that are escaping me from ad libbing. Um, but I also um, think of Santee's work um, beyond the page and beyond the classroom. Before I get to that part, I will share with you some of the words that others have said about Santee's book, Aurum, which is the second book following Dark 30, which came out in 2009. Terence Hay says, Aurum is a trove of sensation. These poems leap in the mind with a mix of acuity and wildness. Santi Frazier's verbal intensities radiate from a deeply meditative marrow. His poems feel simultaneously allegorical and personal, relaxed and rigorous. Technical mastery is tethered to soul. Each time I read this book, I am more amazed. And Cynthia Cruz writes, Part testimony, part archival project, Aurum is constructed of disparate narratives and fragments, lists of objects, and a series of drawings. These poems, like fine jewels, radiate through an impenetrable darkness, like the lives depicted in this triumphant collection. Um, I also wanted to say, um, uh, I wanted to say a few words about the type of leadership that Santee has displayed and the type of spaces that he's made for writers, um, and especially for me as a parent, um, the encouragement and support um, he's given me in my own work as a parent. Um, I'm very proud to say that my sons are with his daughter now um, here, and I feel very good that my sons get to see her again. Um, also wanted to mention um, that um, Santi is an amazing, he's an amazing teacher, um, but also I think about the, the work that the MFA program in creative writing at the Institute of American Indian Arts did, um, especially since its first days, and about the rigor and um, attention, not only that Santi brings to each line of his own work, but to the work of those he reads, um, but also that attention and rigor to creating the kinds of spaces where people can learn together um, in a really challenging set of environments. Um, and I'm very pleased um, to be able to hear his poems again tonight. And um, also is remembering how Sydney, we met for the first time in 2011 at AWP in Chicago briefly, and then again here in Boston in 2013. But um, I was remembering how when I was an undergraduate here um, at Harvard, I had taken a creative writing workshop and was just about to finish my undergraduate degree and 
the instructor that I had wrote me a letter at the end and said, well, now that you're done with Harvard, you should really go to IAI and get your get another get another undergraduate degree from there because there are some really good poets there, like Santee Frazier <laughs> um, and Sherwin Bitsui, um, uh, Kathy Tugnuck Rexford, uh, Gigi Okpik, um, Lady Long Soldier. Um, I feel like I'm for Orlando White. I mean, an amazing cohort. Um, but I also think of the care and consideration um, that uh, Santi brought to all of us as poets and also in the MFA program at IAIA. Um, so thank you, Santi, and I'm looking forward to hearing your poems. I'm just going to pretend I'm on like a journalism assignment and I'm not going to take my things off. I'm just going to kind of move it to the back. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it that way. So I've also learned to be incredibly efficient um, teaching and commuting during this time, especially during the fall semester, where, um, you know, I always have my work with me and, you know, read on this small thing. Um, and um you know just mainly just to be to focus on the teaching we have so many things that we have to go through in a day because of covid you know to teach you know in a mask and all of these other things so um you know i, I just try to you know during this time try to really focus on the work that we're doing because as poets and as people that are interested in poems and um you know that are sort of dedicate our lives to the written word i think you know those things are always always important and i always feel like even just gathering into this place, right, in this particular moment, right, is 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 meaningful, right? Should be meaningful for all of us, and I think that's one of the things that the the pandemic has taught me, right? The the importance of gathering together, right, and just listening to you know other writers, other poets, um, other thoughts, and so on and so forth. And so I'm grateful to be here, and thank you, Joan, for the the introduction and. Um, probably far more than I deserve, but I'm grateful nonetheless. And I'm also just want to congratulate Sasha LaPointe on, you know, her uh, works that are going to be coming out and just um, all of the sort of amazing um, know, the images and sounds that, that sort of are emanating from your poems that you read tonight. I'm grateful. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do a couple of things in the reading. I have, um, I have four new poems that I'm going to read that I think are on a different register than some of the other work that I've done. But I want to, I always like to try to fuse it together because I feel like they all exist in the same world. But I, I'm going to start with the four new poems because I feel like they weren't necessarily written um, in the pandemic. It was a way that I was feeling just before, right? We sort of all went into lockdown and so on and so forth. And um, I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of time to write because I was directing um, the IAI MFA. And so, I was writing these very sort of small brief poems, sometimes just a line in a day. Um, and um, I'd noticed that I'd gotten really sensitive to sounds, right? Like sort of being in alone, like in a, in a place, hotel room, something like that. And I could always hear buzzing and I would started getting really fearful that I would start to lose my hearing. Um, and so I started writing poems sort of toward that. I don't know how to explain them other than that. That's kind of what the poems are attempting to do, but it takes me a long time uh, to write. Hello, Zoom, and shout out to any of my students that are watching from UMass. Um, and also, I think some IAI folks are tuning in. Rowie, if you're there, hello. It's good to see you or not see you. Look through the camera and see you. <laughs> so so these, these newer poems, I feel like are more, um, they're sort of more, I guess more sort of lyric. Um, poems, and I'll just read them. Immure. The ordering of things by scripture. The beguiling chronicle of subluxation. Not quite cadaver or bludgeoned relic, but clavicle marmalized to dust. As to flay tussled locks at the follicle, worn as utricle, adorned with veiny bracts, a lone snap of bark, a trilling far off in the drizzle, the dusk steeped in gunmetal, exhaust gnaws the yonder, a clangorous veil, discarnate, undulating through pine, resigned to muck, to spade, to rip and uproot, 
a brackish tomb, the disarrangement of sockets, torquing skull on the mill tooth. And this is a sort of a riff on uh, Wallace Stevens' poem. Um, it's just variations on loneliness. I haven't quite found a title. Titles are kind of like the last thing that I do. Um, uh, I, I feel like we, you know, there's often like that sort of that triggering moment where you figure out what, a, you know, the, it gives you the sound or the sort of the thing that a poem wants to do and you sort of title it that. Um, but I feel like a poem after I've lived with it for, you know, a year or so, or, you know, the, the poems change, but this is sort of like the, the method in which I wrote the poems, right? So these sort of these variations, each stanza is a variation. A white light spalls through the drab. Curtains beige and stiff. Outside, limbs, ground, a glow. A lean of snow carved by a dim wind. Tires hiss the wet asphalt. In the pining for the slow hum of gears, a rumble in the cavern of ear, low hung limbs vein distance, pump jacks nod dirt, a dreary run of hours, the brush bending, dustless. Light and sound shaping the blackness, Sometimes distance is a malady fraught with undazzling clank as to skim slick misty bark or hum a tune of rot. I envy dreams that cleave well-bred spells of woe that vector ache and rifle the banal into dusks ornamented with kindling as to argufy small oblivions cold and speared by ochreish glint. Drizzle and trill. Pavement roars the thin dark to dawn, the softest of dreads. In the brain's dark, the metal noise of work wanes, and I wince as the quiet. Um, I wince in the quiet as beltings and welts shape themselves into the gray sunup, the slightest of umbrage tracing the edges of verse rung of linity. I uncork the amber and swill. My neck slumps and nod to excise misbelief as headlights beam the length of a bridge where below the stream is high, the current swirling, bugs not yet buzzing the thicket. The day begins in blur and racket, the whine of diesels, the grunt of gears, a voice, a void of wrenches and pistons, and I stare until the drizzle becomes rain and the rain clicks. Very lonely, bleak poems. I don't, I mean, you can try to tell your poems what to do, um, but I find that if you're committed to craft, right, if you're committed to, you know, interacting with the language, right, that you don't really have a lot of control over that, right, the sounds and things like that, and the, what the poem wants to do, the poem, the, the sounds that the poem wants to make. Lacrimose. The slow crawling light wilts into the dark crags of asphalt. The moon rings the dim lit room, the scraping, the fire, dust in the deep flesh of ear. Strike a match, watch the flame, the scraping, the fire ring in unison the brain's bent feud. Yoke mica, deafen glint, scrape and fire, the moon ringing the dim lit room, a louse in the crevice of brain, wrinkle scape in knuckles flexed, lashed, etched around the steel, the affliction of squalor, a pummeling, skull and brain smelted, Starless. And so um, I'll move on to um, Aram. 
I almost wanted to read a poem from Dark Thirty, but I can't, I haven't been able to do that for the last couple of years. It's just the language and the, the way that I was writing poems doesn't speak to me as much as it once did. And it's mainly because of the way that I wrote Aram. And I, you can still hear pieces of it in the language of the new poems where I was really sort of intent on stripping the narrative away from the poem, right? Um, trying to bring to relief the essential sort of sounds of the poem. And so um, a lot of that work in Aram uh, happens in the second half, and I'll read some of that, and then I'll read maybe like a couple of mangled pieces. Matins. Outside the dusty town, the yonder is burnt orange, sun still gnawing at the stars. This is not fate, the antiphon says. In this version of the tale, you took to slaughter with tawny chests fortified by the thin Andean air. Orthos. Outside the dusty town, the yonder is burnt orange, sun still gnawing at the stars. This is not fate, the psalm says. In this version of the tale, you learned squalor by sharpening your skull to selenum, by flaying skin with a fluted blade. Just another, that's another poem. So one of the things that I was trying to do um, in this work at the beginning, right? And I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a sort of a more narrative poem that's representative of Dark Thirty, and then I'm going to go back to the sort of the work, the type of work that I'm doing now. And since uh, Joan had mentioned my family, my daughter, this is more of a poem about my son. But I'll just go ahead and read this one. This is sort of more of like a Larry Levis type of poem, but I always like to show a range in the type of poems that I like to write. It's uh, Sun Perch. It is late, but outside the night is glowing with snow and street light. It's quiet, but for the growl and skid of the plows. Winter, Syracuse where the fainting snow fusses and scatters until it collapses roofs and power lines. And now sitting in that gauzy light, nothing but the sounds of sleep, my son's cub-like snore, I'm reminded my childhood was spent in another city, alone, a boy who knew nothing of evenings, only by the gradual blackening behind buildings, jar bugs pinging electric poles, from the street curve hearing the clink of dishes, the chuckles of supper. I remember a fish staring blankly at me from the center of a round plate rimmed with almond-eyed bluebirds, wings extended, mid-flap. The fish, perhaps lightly steamed, then walk-fried, charred along the belly, fins crisp, mouth open from its last breath, fossilized in a reduction of fish sauce and honey. Next to the plate, a bowl of steamed rice. I sat at the table waiting, not knowing how to eat the rice or fish with chopsticks, smiling as best I could while in Vietnamese, John explained that I'd lived three blocks away and that I'd been home alone for days. His father looked at me as he left the kitchen, wearing the shirt of a machinist, Paul sewn in above the right pocket. Later, I would learn he worked three jobs and his only day off, Sunday, after mass, he would drive his family to some faraway lake outside the city where they would reel in sun perch and net them both side. The smells of cooking oil and aromatics fading, John translated for his mother, um, translated for his mother who asked me to sleep over and I said, no, thank you, smiled, walked home to whatever misfortune awaited in that dark house where the plumbing was empty, my bed, a pallet of blankets on the living room floor. I said no, not out of shame, but because I wanted to lie down and remember how I'd used my fingers to create, scrape flesh off bones, skin tearing with it, and how I trembled when asked to eat the eyes, fins, and tail. I remember now how in the throes of labor my wife looked at me, how she gripped my hand when the pain ruptured up, and how through it all, behind the brown webbing of her pupils, there was gentleness. When our son finally came, he could not breathe. He was blue, motionless. I remember the midwife rushing him off and minutes later hearing the gasping ball. 
I didn't know what I saw as my son shivered, hands gnarled, locked in cry, still blind from birth, breathing underneath a plastic dome. And thinking, thinking of it now, that faraway lake, my first catch flopping in the hole of the boat and later jerking the hook from its mouth, the perch must have been stunned by the sudden uselessness of its gills. And as I, as I watched it gasp against the hull of the boat, I wished what all boys wished for, a way of remembering how air rushes from your body after being socked in the gut, and how to sit in the dark, alone, when street light is just enough for a boy to make shapes with his hands, a play made of light, light made of snow. Now, let's see. And then I'll read one that's about my daughter. So, load. In the mirror, I see how your mouth made vows when you sang into a mug of lager. Always in the misted window light, a gush in the throat, some memory under your wrinkled brow. Not eggs in the grease, not flame under skillet, but glowered lips gripping the strife. Minnows shine in the divots of your forehead, sun up shading craggy punched sheetrock, my cheek scraping the balding linoleum, crumbs of bacon and black pepper under the rust speckled stove. Not the stereo blaring the trailer tin, no poor man's dollar hollered to the pounding of biscuit dough, the rain shaking window, just a wild grimace in the dark. In the evenings, watching your hair bounce until all I could see was the dark and the swallows of flat beard numb me to sleep. And looking at our faces, I realize this isn't much, that all I have to offer is the sound of road in the inner ear. And thinking of those days, I imagine melting your records in the slow embers of the wood stove fire, watching them burn to black smoke. But this isn't about anger. It's about our faces my daughters too, as we stand here in the mirror, chest to chest, me holding her, twitching and stiff as she brails my lips. The black of her pupil, a marble burnished with womb, not yet etched with dollar. It's about your head, wrapped in gauze, face stitched, nose to cheekbone. So that's like sort of the last poem that I wrote about my mother. Um, but her and my, my mother and my daughter share a lot of, they, they're alike in many ways, um, although my daughter will never really know that because uh, my, my mother passed on some time ago. Um, but I, I, the poem sort of can be a space for that, to sort of mark those similarities and find a way to reconcile that, the love that I have with my daughter and the, the anger and pain that I experienced from my mother. I love that poems can do that. So um, I think I'll skip the mangled and I'll just read like one or two sections from Half Life and then uh, we can move on. Iron glowing in the dim, the trailer house skewered by smoke pipe, walls smeared up by, uh, smeared by greased up hands, sink overflowing with crusty pans. Your ear to the floor, you hear cars shadowing a scene on curtains, chrome and glass shaking the trailer tin. Ear to the floor, one eye in the crack of the door, you see a curling iron, empty pack of cool, bits of crumb and toenail, hardened pools of wax, red as lovemaking, the smell of mucus and salt. Nomads in the city peddling jailhouse scrawls of silver and gold wigwams. You hear the factory jutting and jogging cans of corn niblets down a snaking ring of gears. Outside the dusty town, the yonder is burnt orange, sun still gnawing at the stars. Pickups bucking wing nuts, carburetors, distributor caps, or dislodged earth. The radio whispers a piano that vibrates gospel when it utters, simmering corn filling the house with a thick, nutty perfume. What sounds but guzzle of a pumped well, the gushing water, 
against the metal. This is slowness, sighting of grass, chucking grain toward chickens, low bark of hounds, gnats backlit by the sun, their flight pattern scattered in gold. So that's it. Thank you. Just before I give the attention over to Joan, I just wanted to say what an amazing uh, book Dark Traffic is. I taught this book over the semester to my grad and undergrad students, and it was just sort of um, amazing how much, um, I don't know, how much of uh, craft and imagination, all of those things that went into the book, and just thinking about a poetry collection as trying to embrace as much as possible, right, to be inexhaustible. Um, and I think, you know, some of, we had some amazing discussions in my classes, and I think it's just an amazing book, Joan. Thank you for having me read tonight, and thank you for the book. Um. Thank you, Shanti. Oh my gosh, I feel like uh, I've forgotten how lucky we were each residency to hear you read. I, I this was amazing. And again, thank you, Joan, for having us both here to read your book. Um, I am not good at freestyling, so I'm going to read um, the bio, the next intro. Um, I will freestyle that Joan and I have our matching earrings on, and that's very special to me. Little power earrings. So, yeah. Yes. Um, I'm going to start with Joan's formal bio because it's incredibly impressive and this woman deserves to be celebrated. And then I'm going to share some of my own sap sappy nonsense because I have a lot of feelings. <clears throat> Joan Navayat Kane is a Nupiak with family from Uyavak and Tulavak. The author of eight collections of poetry and prose. She teaches creative writing at Harvard and Tufts, is a lecturer in the Department of Studies and Race, Colonialism and Diaspora at Tufts, and was founding faculty for the graduate creative writing program at the Institute of American Indian Art. She was the visiting fellow of race and ethnicity at the Center for the Study of Race, race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University in 2020 and 2021 and the 2021 Mary Rout Endowed Chair of Creative Writing and Journalism at Scripps College. Her second book, Hyperboreal, winner of the 2012 Donald Hall Prize and American Book Award, and a finalist for the 2014 Penn Center USA Literary Award, Award will be published in translation by Editions Characters in the coming year. She has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Whiting Writers Award, an American Book Award, the United States Artist Creative Vision Award, the Donald Hall Prize, the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation National Artist Fellowship, the Alaska Literary Award, and fellowships from the Radcliffe Institute, the Ramesson Foundation, the School for Advanced Research, Brown Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race in America, Lannan Foundation, and Malay Arts. She raises her sons in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So she's up to a few things. Um, so Joan and I met when I was still an undergrad at the Institute of American Indian Arts, and right away I was drawn to her. I remember thinking, whoa, who is this total badass who just popped into Mokna for the student reading that you mentioned earlier, with a backpack on, looking like she had just hiked across Santa Fe. She joined us afterwards for crepes and coffee somewhere in the plaza, and I remember thinking, surely this incredible poet, this force of a woman, has more pressing things to do right now then chat with me about music and bands and writing and what crepe toppings are best. But she was so present and so generous with her time and attention. It was impossible not to immediately admire and respect her. But later that same day, when I first heard Joan read, I knew immediately I had found a lifelong mentor and friend. Because of my grandmother's work with our tribe's Lushutu language revitalization, I grew up immersed in language. And up until that point, I hadn't quite figured out how to hold on to those words or what they meant to me. When Joan read so beautifully and so powerfully, both in English and in Nupiaq, I was so moved. I was transported back to a time rich with language. I hadn't even realized how badly I had been missing it, but I knew in that moment that I had been grieving. Our languages are very different, but when Joan read those words, 
I feel this, like I felt this spark of connection and this empowering command over poetry from this woman. When she unapologetically presents entire pages in her traditional language, I feel so inspired. I feel seen, I feel heard. I feel not only as another poet, but also as an indigenous woman. Joan's work definitely changed something in me. It opened something in me. And I know she's changing and challenging things on a much more massive scale. With each new beautiful book she brings into the world, she's carving out new spaces and changing the literary landscape. I am forever grateful for this woman's strength and wisdom and guidance, and more importantly, for her friendship. Because without it, I'm not sure I would have even completed my MFA, let alone a collection of poetry. So forever, 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 thank you, Joan. And please welcome my friend, Joan King. Um, to make it through, um, to make it through Santee reading um, Sun Perch and that introduction without ugly crying for everyone, um, anyone um, watching on Zoom, um, I'm proud of myself not to be <laughs> ugly crying. Um, I'm called for my namesake, Nevayuk. My family is from Uluvuk, King Island, and Clark, Mary Zuzu. I am going to start tonight um, with a poem that's about beginnings and endings. Um, and uh, the first couple of poems actually, well, beginnings and endings. And um, the title is Nunatak, um, which um, the word Nuna means land. Um, and uh, Tak um, is a suffix means pertaining to or made of. Um, and it, it, so Nunatak actually refers to this geographical feature of a peak that um, has um, been raised above, or has remained, um, remain, remain a peak um, despite glaciation around it that's since retreated or melted. Um, and uh, yeah, this poem is called Nunatak. Um, in a strait, some things are useful. Others true, she turns to ash, thrust thus her head thick with arrogance, infection, and futility. It could be how a young wife went, strewn with net veins, willow and mountain aben, trespass and wreckage. She could write about the year she turned to heat and haze, to lays, imumurat, imarachtunga, of cannula and silver nitrate, of petiolus and akeen, about to begin again of greens as they green, of a man aged, eschered, of a confined green to hereby dissolve and hold for naught the soil, gravel, silt, groaning as the tools of our penultimate glacier, a glacier I might pronounce like grief. One does wish for words to thaw in a mouth, but find instead a tongue, welt, erosional or depositional, raised and visible, rift into language and grit. Um, the next couple of poems, well, as with that one, which was about uh, marriage, um, there's some, there's some um, widows and widowers in the next couple ones. Um, but like CNT interested in, um, removing a lot of the, or not, or working outside of narrative um, for most of these poems, but um, here it is, Cutting the River. I woke up like this on the shore of a snow-beaten sea during the dark part of a day that will darken like the others into the dark winter. When the tragic figure thinks of death, he thinks of me. In this way, I'd become at last another bright departure. Halt Lhasa and yet high fed, witness the mountain I make of his grass widow before her middle too is worn away with reckless weather. I believed I sequenced these poems in the order of having widowers and widows. Indeed, I did. Okay. Well, I was glad to see 
that my notes, if they exist, match the page. Um, field work. Um, field work. Another day of heat. Strangers continue to wobble across the horizon, bringing drought when instead we should have deluge. I steep snow lichen in water I drew from a lake which has since gone dry. At sea, few understood me, as though I induced a sickness that deafened, then healed. As before, I predict lies to be pushed from the boat time and time again. Nevertheless, I expect to get by while their widowers seek refuge with their provident families. Perhaps a storm will pile fish at their door when the red tide rises. Perhaps they will not follow as we move moon into moon under another sky. So this next poem was originally titled Upon Learning That She's Hung a Fox Pelt from the Rafters from Ted Hughes. Oh, Upon Learning That She's Hung a Fox Pelt from Ted Hughes from the Rafters above her desk. Um, but then I felt like that was giving away too much. Um, and I wrote it um, in conversation with um, an Alice Oswald poem. Um, actually, I remember writing, writing this poem at the same time Sasha was finishing one of her two MFAs. I, I, um, and reading Alice Oswald's book, Falling Awake, um, the poem Slow Down Blackbird, um, which has in it three characters, three people in raincoats uh, losing their tracks in the snow. And then elsewhere in the poem, three people getting rid of themselves. Um, and as it turns out, um, Alice Oswald may or may not write with a fox pelt from Ted Hughes hanging from the rafters above her desk. But in any case, this poem is just called Upon Learning That She's Hung a Fox Pelt. Not an easy thing to shake as she defers her rapprochement with Apodea over false ox lip and phlox. A glacier makes a river of ice, of earth, of everything that is and is not she. A paradox. The present is a dark text to return into. She strikes the bright inscriptions which might yet teem for a long time. We tread the paths of myth grown sick, like the boy who banged and adds until it grew dull and the snow ceased. And like that which presupposes it and us, line, image, lilt. I'm not quite myself within other declarations. I do not exalt with great nimbleness and did not notice the lemming as he slipped through a hole in the fenestra on some annual migration to the sea past himself as his own pelt monger and far past the point where he pulled an all through the fosses. In these words enclosed too at times within the old enchantments one broods beyond the problem of being bound to place to anything at all. And then the ballista too becomes its own source of wonder. An omen, albeit one tempered by the concise splendor of a mind as it moves quick on sick within the confines of night. Breach lyric, split time. Will she? She will explicate the fixed architecture as it flickers by trying over and over its broken line, trying over. Um, on the off chance that my mom is on Zoom, um, I will say, mom, this poem quotes you, and I get asked about it all the time in interviews. Um, so yeah, there's my mom in this poem, a quote from her. Gray eraser. There's no one to scold, even when the heavens seem the most abject of failures, receptive to correction. Likewise, in cackleless sleep, the magpies remain tucked away. A mother can no longer dismiss her child as a spectacular waste of an education. Even the wind stills its sighs in the dry and bare branches of the nearby white spruce damaged by virula blight. Meanwhile, a pearl green fox retracts its untrust tail through an eastward sky thick with unfamiliar stars. If I wake missing the cold, 
fresh sound of new snow. I may still miss the kinds of places that scar me and complete my sorrow. Late at night, the birches must let their leaves pitch and imbricate the floor of what is left of the woods near what is left of me. Um, I have had a conversation recently with a poet in the room about Jean Valentine, um, who I would have dropped out as one of my um, former classmates, call, uh, of a fellow alums of Columbia's MFA program knows. I was really close to just um, ditching out um, on, on poetry. And, um, and then I had a workshop with Jean Valentine and um, it's actually, it was in Philly and um, I, there just been this earthquake in Alaska, not the big one in 2018, the big, big one, um, but another one. And um, I just had surgery and I heard something in the kitchen. And I, I didn't think anything was that bad. I went the next morning and um, this big thing of honey from Costco fell from one of the open shelves in the kitchen onto the floor. And um, I'd gone to Philly and was meeting up with uh, uh, Matt Hooley. Um, and, and I just had a conversation with Jean about this earthquake. And she said, you need to write about that honey. Um, that's that, you know, this is enormous pool of honey on the floor. It was the only damage in that earthquake to the house. But, um, but Matt said, yeah, you need to listen to Jean and you need, you need to write that poem. So this is what came of it. Milk Black Carbon. Observe the coal dust over boats in the harbor, the snow load on the glacier. Take in the woman who pursues a myth to counter another myth. What dazes, scatters, and filters, each respiration blurs an image. The coal tipple tilts in its blue skin, meadows blonde. From open shelves, honey jars tumble the split and spill in the gasp of a tumbler. The thick odor of a nearby smoke will signal the end of something not summer. The fire veins as sap does, translating sands of beetle killed spruce to crackle and torch. She cannot hurt too much, too long. Take in the woman you have not become. And then take a little breath and hold your breathing. Breathe, don't move, and hold your breath again. Um, this poem is called, I Defer a Second Opinion. Um, Anna, you have a voicemail. <laughs> um, oh, did I write the page down wrong? I did not. Um, okay, I defer a second opinion. I just looked up this house that is in the poem um, on Google Maps for some reason a couple weeks ago, and it was most of these trees have been cut down now. I learned. I defer a second opinion. The light unevenly gray, well beyond the triple pane, may be neglected or itself self filtering, obscuring as it crystals into existence, as it opaques the whore on the fence and brack to branch of all my trees, our yard, my debt unpruned lilac, two liability spruce to the north, the ostentatious sprawl of crab apple once fertile next door, then storm felled, now thrust into the yarrow as it overgrows our bed, a triplet of rowan, then sour, then choke cherry, not least two or five cedar, cottonwood and aspen, and in alder hell, I squalled predictably into the right of way. A birch I see almost too much to name. Black spruce too. You don't have a personality disorder, said she, a good doctor, but one of three women of color licensed to practice psychiatry in the state of Alaska between guffaws. Another in Fairbanks. And what use is she to me so far away? probably overbooked and kind enough to do what she would, to see me as a patient, to prescribe whatever I will take for whatever she happens to think she might fix or for now temporarily stay. I see the dark 
horizon in the west. It rhymes with nothing. Nothing, you see. Sometimes, oh, this poem. You can tell which poems I wrote in Cambridge and which ones I didn't. Um, sometimes they're even scars. And waking night after night in an apartment parched, I look out the window into the dark for some glimpse of what I have lost. An ocean that held so many boats built by men now dead. Numerous windings through scree to crown, drive line, cairns, lines. I see nothing but the sky. Sometimes stars as bright as collar collarbones gleam before I blink, then find these firmaments also disappeared. Other nights, something Atlantic heaves with rain. When the storm lifts the way, perhaps it will have left gaffed fish, surplus for a child and another child to find. Perhaps I will no longer fight the mind that might hold but one swan, one hair, one figure. Perhaps I will not begin to cry because of the ways in which I mark the months as they accumulate and fall away. No blood, no certainty. I might yet reek of burnt things. My skirt may carry their stains as I pass trap after deadfall trap, the burn, the coffle of dog hitched to dogs, hitched to a lading of oil. I just have three more poems. And um, whew, um, this is the first live reading or in-person reading I've done since um, March of 2020. Um, so thanks for coming out tonight. And I'm glad to be wearing a mask so you can't see my gnarly um, face underneath the mask from the massive accident I had at the end of October. Um, okay, that's enough ad-libbing. I'm going to stop in case Sherwin Bitsui's watching and is like, oh no, she's going to ad-lib. Okay, <laughs> rehearsal for surveying the ruins. Unable to construct a more compassionate narrative, I have drowned and turned back into myself, pitiless, traveling north against the waves. If at the end, I remain paper thin. I do not want to hear ceaselessly of it. I no longer circle the graves of the dead, the ones who exact so much from the living. Beneath a birch whose limbs had grown too large, I left 11 lanieries and poppies gone to seed. Some objects I slipped in their brackets, others we concealed from all seers save the skulk of polar foxes and their blue morph, who may soon inhabit what yet stands of the house as we abandoned it. Let us thwart deceptive emptiness and suppose a deaccessioned hawk and handsaw through the scuttle, for I have, I had, and would have had again. Um, when I um, lost my uncle Willie um, this September, um, and I received the first copies of this book in the mail um, around the same time. I re started reading it from the first poem and got really scared, thinking, "Wow, I really, um, I got really scared about." Um, you know, I thought I'd written poems for a long time because they didn't have anything to do with the real the life that I lived as I was living it. And then I started reading this and. Um, arguing with myself about that idea. Rookeries. All men knew a secret of the northern part of an old world, a less perfect idea. For the bicornuate woman, it was an island. Though its birds lose our trust, we might learn their language. After all, we had been taught to read and write to remove our hands from other work as we watch water twist into rock, to cover our wounds, staying alive light after light. For something, I worry. The moon pronounces with clarity its known topography. Our letters and lists reconstructed grammars. They replace the ways in which we are grabbed and pushed, then shoved. 
set a wife and her children to rove with indefinite orders. Lineal migration on a small scale is not nautical, but conflictual. Of those men, we knew I could never do them any good. In this way, I forget and let the wind river. It gales and tears at my shoulders and wrists. Um, this is my last poem. And I'll just say it started originally with an epigraph by James Merrill, which was, um, yes, melting changes the whole picture. Dark traffic. And the snows buffer the sound of a voice set forth. I thought her lost already, that she had gone to neglect the late migration. Before it ceases, the ice collapses easily. There is no day without a symptom. Consolation may turn out to be a guttural practice after all, the small gesture of sound lodged deep before it glides without warning downward. There is nothing but the wind, a howl and dive where water is thrown over water and sewn into it. A howl and dive of wind, water she found flown over water where once we found ice where the snow once stuttered the sound of that shouter shouting for this listener, holding her head in her hands, the head in its fine blank way and original. Thank you. Couple of questions if the poets are willing. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll okay. yeah, we'll okay. <laughs> um, at least for a picture, if there's no questions. Yeah, no questions. Yeah. yeah. Do I have to start? Yeah, you're the, yeah. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I'm like, I always look to Santee. I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, it makes, it makes writing poems possible. Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a city um, and in a state where it's not a priority for, um, for anyone to, anyone who makes who has the money and makes a decision for native kids to um finish you know even even high school and then much less go on to get the kind of education they want in order to figure out what to do you know with this thing that we have this life and um i mean it certainly um I would say that you know my experiences with academia were such that I wasn't really all. I moved back to Alaska thinking I would never teach. Um, then it was actually through coming to know IAIA and the and what it was, what the Institute of American Indian Arts was, and also in my family how um, you know uh, there you know there I have relatives who are proud of me, but when one of my uncles, um, my uncle Robert learned that um, I was going to visit IAIA for the first time in 2011. He's like, wow, he's like, oh, that's so cool. I got in there, but he and another of my relatives, we got in, we got accepted and we were gonna go, but then at the last minute we chickened out. It was too far from home. Um, and I'm thinking about IAIA and 
a very different approach to um, teaching and, and learning um, is very different from, from other places. And I think um, I'm still learning. I'm learning um, not just from the students I've worked with, but also from the colleagues I have who have, are amazing teachers um, and, and readers. And I hope I can bring that to change, not just the work I do as a poet, but as a teacher and for other poets too. That's a long, End of a long rambling semester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess I could speak to that question a little bit. And I, I guess I'm always sort of interested in the transformative properties of language, right? And how do you get someone to, you know, to sort of take up that task, right, when they're writing poems? Or, or how do you convince them that's what language can do? And I think it's really difficult, I think, in um, in educational environments that are built on the oppression of students. Um, and I think that one of the things that I always sort of consider, right, as a, as a native person, right, education was introduced to, um, you know, American Indian education is, is, is a, is, was at one point a tool of cultural genocide or genocide of the mind, right? You would take native people out of their home communities, educate them, and most of them would never return, right? And I think that there's a really, that's, that's, that's the sort of the most tragic form of racism and oppression, because at the same time, there's this sort of offering of a, um, a I don't know, I guess a release from, right, the sort of the, the overt sort of violence, right, of, that, that's associated with colonial histories. And so my sort of idea is that through teaching that you know, we can, we, you know, as a, with those particular experiences, right, that, that, um, that we can sort of come to the classroom and together, right, sort of work out how we can create a better sort of academic culture to where we're all learning from one another, we're all sort of a part of a community. And I sort of base it in this very simple idea that I learned living in the Onondaga Nation, which is a Haudenosaunee teaching, is that everybody in the community has two talents, right? The first um, talent is the individual talent, right? It's oftentimes what you would sort of, you know, when you critique someone's poems, it's their individual talents, what they're trying to do, how they're trying to engage language. But then there's also, and this is the, the individual talent is largely what we focus on in MFA programs, right? Um, very sort of ego driven, selfish sort of act, right? A lot of the times whenever you're critiquing and you're worried about a, a professor destroying your ego, right? <laughs> like those things, right? Very individual. But the second talent is everybody has a talent that is for the collective or for the people, right? And those two things aren't, don't necessarily have a correlation, right? But everybody has something to offer to the collective, to the group, right? And I think that that's really important to cultivate both of those talents and students. And that in and of itself can be sort of a, that allows for transformative sort of moments, teaching moments in the classroom. Because most of the time we're not teaching just the words and techniques and all of these other things, right? But we're trying to, you know, at least as a native person, I'm trying to find a way to engage language that is beyond the language that was given to me or forced upon me, right? Through, you know, different histories, books, texts, so on and so forth. And so I think that that's largely what poems can do, right? It can sort of occupy and sort of engage in those spaces, right? And sort of going into Fanon, France Fanon, and this sort of idea that whenever a knowledge system, Western knowledge systems create, a language for a people, you're kind of stuck with that language. But I think the poet, right, has a has a sort of responsibility of trying to transcend that language, right? But it comes from a deep interrogation of English, too. Um, a little rambly, but um, I'm still kind of in professor mode, so you have to forgive me. Yeah. Um, I think uh, uh, among the three of us, I'm the most new to teaching, um, and I, I definitely want to echo what's already been said. Um, but I am, I am new. I think I've only been teaching for about a year and a half. And I think to speak to my experience, um, I definitely, I find myself struggling sometimes in institutions of academia and then thriving in other places. And I'm still new and I'm still learning like where and what, like, um, like how I really connect with poetry and teaching. Um, for example, this past summer, I had the privilege of working with a like youth arts program in South Seattle. And it was, you know, specifically to create a mural and they also wanted a spoken word and performance element. And it was done in a neighborhood that reminded me very much of home where I grew up on the reservation in Swinomish. And um, apart from being in the class or like, you know, opposite of being in the classroom, I found myself like 
really thriving there as an instructor and connecting with them. And they were all, they were ranging in ages from like 13 to 17. Um, but I left every day feeling really full and really like engaging with these um, students who were like, you know, the first day they were like, what is poetry? Why, why do we care about this? But then like by week two, they were like super stoked and be, being connected in, in that community um, kind of grounded me in a way that I felt more at home. So I guess to answer the question in a weird rambly way is that I'm figuring out where it is that I want to be as um, a teacher. Responses. We have um, another question in the chat, which is, where's the weirdest venue you've read poetry? <laughs> I have so many. Wow. Yeah. Huh. I think by a river in Bluff, Utah. Yeah, that was one of the weirdest, I think. Competing with the river, the sound of the river, and trying to, yeah, that was one of the weirdest. But it was also obviously memorable. Oh, wow. I got some weird ones. I don't want to air all of them. I'll, I'll <laughs> skew the safe one. Anna, I don't know if you were at the Night Cafe reading on September 18th, 2001. Um, maybe not. It was a week after 9-11. Yeah, I was at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was a, a reading series that um, Russell Contreras, um, who's now at Axios, um, and also working on, on this a very um, very difficult first book very well researched um he ran a reading series um called night cafe and um it was nine it was a week after 9 11 and um it's the first time i'd given a reading in new york city and i will say it was i mean new york it was a it was a weird time at the end it was sort of the beginning of the giuliani well whatever anyway um it was weird but the weirdest thing is is that that night I don't know if you were there, but the bartender actually had to hop the bar with the baseball bat because there was a fight that broke out in the bar, and it was the scariest thing. And I've been in some scary situations, <laughs> um, but it was that was definitely the most. That was the weirdest. Yeah. Um, no, it was just the, the tensions were so high. I mean, like every, I mean, like on every corner, there were, you know. It was it was an, it was very it was a very strange time in New York City. Um, I think I think everyone was so sad. I think that now I'm like that was stressful. Like anyway, I'm like that, that was such a baby in terms of stress. But yeah, um, yeah, I don't remember what it was. I mean, it was night cafe. There were yeah, there was some stuff there. I think um, my experience. Um, reading and performing poetry, like mostly they've been weird venues so far. Um, I think the weirdest is I, I went on tour with a band performing spoken word. And um, our first um, spot on tour was Minneapolis and it was this basement and it was like super packed and crowded with like rowdy drunk punks, uh, like throwing beer cans. There was a bunch of beer all over the floor. I remember at one point wondering if I was gonna get electrocuted. And then of course, once I started performing, doing my thing, you just like heard a bunch of like rowdy punks kind of be like, ah, and like run away and like go outside and smoke. And I was like, okay. So I feel like that's maybe my weirdest spot, but then there's like 18 other spots just like it. So I guess all of them are weird so far. <laughs> at this point in my career, they've all been weird. Zoom is a weird, Zoom is a weird place to give a reading. It yeah. feels weird to be back. I feel I'm like, wow, I'm really, this is so different than the Zoom readings. Yeah, but, no, it is. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, how do you think it's possible to connect to that? Yeah, 
I mean, it has to do with, I mean, I think, I think especially with the Yupak language, it has to do with how differently a thought is not just conceived, um, an entire, I mean, an entire, entire, um, it, you know, in English would be a paragraph of information contained within one word um, that has, I mean, and in thinking entirely because of the nature of the language, um, polysynthetic nature, um, there's, you have to know exactly how, what you're going to say before you say it, which is so different than English. And I think, um, I think some of that has to do, I also think that um, the narrative, I, I think of the Inupak language as being a lot more closely related to the lyric tradition for me, because for me, English is, uh, is a talky, you know, um, you know, subject predicate sort of um, language that is given to narrative. So I don't know, I think I'll stop there because now I'm getting talking. I just said subject and predicate. I think I'm cut off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I guess I can respond to that. I, I think for the way that I approach it, or at least my resistance to it, is that um, I think Native Indigenous people already have narratives that have been constructed for us. And if you really look back at um, Indigenous literature, the early forms of it are actually written by a lot of non-Natives. Um, and I feel like um, there are certain, um, there are tropes, there is language and things like that that are that is already sort of predetermined for native people even before we come to the page, right? And so there's a certain colonial narrative and there's also another other histories that have already, that precede us. And so I feel like in the poem is a way of sort of breaking that or dispelling it, right? Um, you know, because whenever a reader comes to any of our works, I think they see the native part first and they start relating back to, oh, okay, so buried my heart at wounded knee, all of these other problematic books of the past, they bring to that experience, right? And so my job, I feel like as a poet is trying to at least sever that in some way, or at least have them move beyond it. And I feel like when I started resisting narrative more so, right, instead of, you know, using certain sort of devices that I was accustomed to, um, breaking that and sort of allowing the sort of the juxtaposition between different stanzas and language and usage of form white space, all of that stuff, allowed me to sort of engage that a little bit more, at least in a way that I was, um, at least in, at least right now in the things that I'm interested in. But I, I'm always sort of at the heart of it trying to, um, I don't know, um, I was at AWP once and this guy wearing a Stanford shirt and he had like a liberal person came up to me and he was like, yeah, you know, uh, natives haven't been writing very long, have you? You've just like very recently just started having, doing literary stuff and, uh, you know, you guys had oral narrative before that, right? <laughs> I'm trying to fight that guy, right? That perspective, right? In, in poems, right? Because it happens often. Yeah. Once someone knows you're native, they want to know, like, if you go to sweat lodges and when your last vision quest was and all of these other things, you know? And you're like, yesterday. Yesterday. You're like, right now. Right now. I'm, yeah. trying, I'm trying to leave. Right this, I'm trying to disassociate right now. <laughs> On behalf of everyone at Goliar, I want to thank you so much for giving a beautiful reading. It was such a special night. Let's give the poets another round. Of now over here, we'll sign some books. Um, our next reading is tomorrow, so if you guys are really interested. Can I you guys for a second? Let me take a picture. Yeah, I'll get a picture too outside later. Okay. But yeah, okay. Oh, oh well, all of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh. Do you want to be in the middle? Okay. It's your, it's sure. Your uh, well, <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. I'm trying to do the body language. Like, are we still on Zoom? Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Just mugging for Zoom. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Can I tell my students their final due tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Now we have a we have pop up finals for everyone. Um, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so